right, well, it being 4 o'clock, I uh, will welcome everybody to the March 15th, 2016 meeting of the Northfield Transportation and Parking Commission. My, my name is Ryan O'Donnell. I'm the chair of the commission. And I would like to uh, first announce the audio and video recording of the back of our heads in the front of your faces. And let's start, as we always do, with introductions for the benefit of the public, starting with uh, Council from Ward 4. I'm Julie Shara. I'm the counselor from Ward 4. I'm uh, happy to be on this commission. I'm new to it. I'm, you often saw me from that side. Um, so I, I was happy to, there was a position open so I could take it from fangirl to just like, <laughs> well, we don't want to disappoint you. Uh, Jamie Fisher, 59 Young Street. I'm also the commission. David Lutta, DPW Engineer. And Brooks Planning Board. Jody Casper, Chief of Police. Christopher Grant, Citizen. Gary Hartwell, Citizen. Mia Forstall, Assistant City Collector. Terry Ushaw, DPW Clerk. We also have Director Wayne Fyatt, Planning Department of Planning Sustainability. So we do have a quorum, and I'll call the meeting to order. And we'll begin, as we always do, with a period of public comment, which is an opportunity for members of the public to speak on any issue you wish. You can certainly speak now. And again, if your uh, item of interest is, appears again farther down on the agenda, or you can just wait for that item, whatever you wish. Um, the only ask is that you keep it to three minutes or less. And it's also not a time where we can respond in back and forth, just because we haven't posted the agenda items in advance uh, for the open meeting as well. So are there any general public comment? Mr. Uh, Zane. So maybe, maybe it's not going to work because you can't respond, but I know uh, our request for crosswalk isn't on the agenda, but a lot of people in our community are asking what the status of it is. And I'd just like to report back to them officially where, where it's at and what the, <clears throat> what the process was or the next step. Okay. Can't respond back? Well, I mean, for the purpose of providing information, my understanding is that the Department of Public Works is uh, going to be looking at it. Uh, from an engineering perspective. Okay. And so that's the work that has to be done now in the deliberation by this commission. And the traffic engineer confirms it. And when you know when when do you think that that's gonna be that's gonna come back to this commission and then we'll be back on the agenda or yep I'm certainly as we have for many meetings going to put this on the agenda for so deliberation. Ryan I can speak to that probably if you want. Um, Without deliberating without deliberating just uh, to let you know that uh, historically the DPW director has, uh, had made it clear to us that uh, mid-block crosswalks were something that we wanted to avoid altogether uh, and so that was what we inherited as a general view and uh, when we started talking internally about the Hampton Avenue crosswalk which would be a mid potentially a mid-block crosswalk we decided it was important to actually um, look into what criteria might actually be a basis for the decision as to whether it's appropriate to have a new crosswalk or not. So we found some guidelines that Brookline is using that are based on the Manual for Uniform Traffic Control Devices and the Federal Highway Administration and ADA uh, accessibility requirements. And we will be evaluating the appropriateness of mid rock crosswalks on Hampton Avenue based on those criteria. Those criteria include traffic counts for speed and volume as well as pedestrian counts. We haven't been able to do traffic counts over the winter time because we can't put down traffic counters if there's a threat of snow. So it's on our agenda to uh, do those counts this spring and then uh, bring that information back to the TPC for review. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Thank you very can much. We can we be informed? Uh, you are when always informed. No, when, when, we're, when yes. we're back on the agenda. Indeed. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Any other public comment? Well, you. Okay, um, you I'm going to. I want to talk about the Monfi thing when it comes up on the agenda. Perfect. So no other public comment. All right, and we'll launch into our agenda. Um, the first item is the election of our vice chair. We have a vacancy in the position of vice chair because Councillor Elisa Klein was the vice chair uh, and is no longer a member of this commission. So uh, I would ask for a motion to open nomination for the position of vice chair. 
So moved. Okay. Um, nominations are open, and so at this time, it would be in order for any member of the commission to suggest a nominee for that position. Don't all do it at once, though, because, well, I would like to just, oh, please, Councilman. Is it necessary that there be a minister? No. Nonetheless, I nominate you as vice chair. <laughs> 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 I get faster. <laughs> I, uh, and the second on that. Second. Okay, Ms. Brooks, second set. Um, are there any other nominations in the court? Move the nominations to be closed. Okay. Is there a second to close the nomination? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? I realize we didn't really vote on the ones open, but I think we can take take it that that would be unanimous as well. So. Um, we have one nomination on the floor. Um, I would invite either the nominee or any other members of the commission to speak uh, <coughs> speak to the nomination. Since I made it, um, I, I will say that I think it's often useful for our city council to occupy that position because there's some work involved in this, and from time to time, the vice chair will have to help prepare an agenda and so forth. And I think that uh, that's that would be. Uh, a good thing for a city councilor to take on, and also uh, Councilor Shera has been in this commission a lot and has already contributed to a lot of housing knowledge. So I think she's a great question. Any, other, any comments from you? Or no, you? I, I appreciate that vote of confidence. Well, if there's no other discussion, then I ask for a, a voice vote is fine. I, all in favor of Councilor Shera as our vice chair. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> um, you never know what may happen in the Transportation Department Commission. Uh, we'll move speedily through our reports. Um, item 5A is the approval of minutes of December 15th and of 2015 and November 17th, 2015. And I would note that no meetings were held in January of 2016 or February of 2016. So. We all miss each other very much and are happy to be back together again. Um, is there a motion to take the approval of both these minutes as a group? Questions? So moved. Okay, Mr. Carlin's motion. Ms. Brooks seconds. Um, is there any discussion or changes to these two minutes? I would note for the new members that often if you weren't part of the meeting, you may wish to abstain but it's not legally required or required by a rule as long as you don't doubt the authenticity and accurateness of the of the meeting itself. So, that requires us. Any other discussion on the minutes? Okay, all in favor of the approval? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstention. <coughs> Two abstentions. Mr. Albert Fisher and Councilor Sheriff Singh. And the minutes are approved. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any bicycle and pedestrian subcommittee updates? Uh, just quickly, the uh, next form of the bike and head plan is on May 10th. Um, and on May 18th, eight days later, is the uh, the workshop on downtown, so, uh, on Main Street, the teacher on Main Street. I'll send you all the notes, but just send you Any uh, departmental updates from the DPW? Ms. Chen. The last year's payment contract, um, Warner Brothers will be back in the first week of April to punch up items. For this year's payment contract, we are planning on saving a part of Parkville Road
Columbia Gas will be re relocating gas lines. <coughs> after that happens, contractor Golden Construction will be starting construction. For traffic calming, the priority ranking is up on the GPC website now. You guys can check that out. Mm -hmm. uh, Lawrence Road will be doing a temporary speed <coughs> early April. And that is based at Florida Hampton Ave Crosswalk. We will be doing a study. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments on the GPW report? Uh, what's, what's the time frame on the, um, the roundabout? This, uh, the contractor is uh, itching to go and we're waiting for Columbia Gas. I mean, time frame for completion. For completion. Um, they have two construction seasons actually completed, but they're uh, Although they're off to a late start already because of Columbia Gas, uh, the original intention was to have it substantially uh, reconfigured by the end of this construction season with uh, uh, periphery, peripheral work done the following season, namely sidewalks and uh, striping and curbing and that sort of thing. But the, the general configuration is intended to be complete by the end of this construction season. Thank you. And the other question was the uh, temporary speed pumps on Florence Road. Uh, those are the, the rubber ones that have been removed Correct. before winter. Um, and how many of those are going down? Yeah. Most likely one. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? I just said one. Do you have a, a map or a list of where the accessible push button uh, crossing devices might be placed? Yes, I do have a map. I can okay. that too. <laughs> okay. Can you summarize? I imagine they're mostly just downtown. Or are they not? Um, yeah. Around downtown, buses on Route 66. Uh huh. Uh, okay. Road. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. No, thank you very much for that update. Uh, no other planning updates or anything like that? Any I just want to small thing. Yeah. You know, we have this public health grant to pay for the Alta bike pet plan. Um, we also got approval to buy two pedestrian counters with that, but pedestrian bike counters. So uh, DPW can count cars already, and MassDOT has car counters. We don't have any pedestrian counters. We have two permanent stations out, probably one on Main Street, and one on the bike path. So, so does that, do you envision that <coughs> data to be useful in terms of future grants? Yeah, we make changes. Planning? You know, when we did the work at Pleasant Street, we realized there's a lot of data out there for bicycle pedestrian journey to work, but very little data out on other journeys, bicycle pedestrian journeys. So just to give us a sense of what those are. We just completed some counts on Main Street and Pleasant Street. And Pleasant Street was close to 2,000 people a day. Main Street was 2,000 people a day, which is more than 10 times as much as, frankly, downtown Springfield or Pleasant Street. So it's nice to get a sense of what those things are. And what time of year was that, did you say? It was in the last couple of weeks. The last couple of weeks? Oh, okay. Nice weather. Not nice weather. March, but <laughs> <laughs> Any questions or comments about planning departments? Thank you very much. Um, no announcements or presentations today. We have an ambitious agenda and there's people here for lots of different things. So I'd like to balance um, items where there may be a lot of people with yeah, items that I suspect will uh, not take a lot of time. So in that latter category, let me ask um, that we shift to um, 7A, which is a Chamber of Commerce request to close the Strong Avenue parking lot uh, from February 29th to April. Excuse me, April 29th. <laughs> yeah, that would be, that would be a long discussion, I think, right? April 29th to April 30th, 2016. We have the executive director of the Gus organization here to Thanks. present the issue. So um, I'm Suzanne Beck, the executive director of the Northampton Chamber of Commerce. And for the third year, we're planning um, a fundraiser with the East Side Grill. And in order to do that, we've occupied the Strong Avenue parking lot um, for the day of the fundraiser. So this year, it's Friday, April 29th. We generally do it the first Friday in May, but that happens to be um, UMass graduation weekend. So we push the event back, because that'll obviously be, parking will be a premium that weekend. Our, uh, we take the parking lot the night before and, well not really take it the night before, but it's closed all day on the 29th and then we put it back into operation uh, early Saturday morning. In the last two years we've done that by 10 o'clock in the morning. But I do, when do we actually take the parking lot? We um, typically 
um, I meet Brian from the parking office there about 6 a.m. Friday morning, oh, but we put notices out on the meters overnight that we're asking cars to be out by 2 a.m. So that is Kristen Cole, the Director of Operations in the Chamber, and she manages the event. So, yes. yeah. And uh, thank you very much. And Mr. Pomerantz, the Director of Central Services, is not here, but <clears throat> I'm not aware of any, any major logistical problems in, in past years when we've done this. So. Um, and this is something that you and I have talked about, but just for the benefit of the public, um, we have had discussions about um, how the closure of the lot has an impact on surrounding businesses, on Strong Avenue, and um, the vicinity. My understanding is we've talked to businesses after hearing from them last year, and now there's an accommodation of some time to make sure when this happens. Is that right? Yes. I'm happy to explain that Would in you more please? detail. Yeah, sure. You. So the two businesses that were uh, expressed concern last year were Von Me, Saigon, and uh, uh, Ibiza, the tapas bar. So in those cases, it was too late for us to make any major accommodation. Um, so what we did was follow up with them and ask how the how the event affected them. So we would have a better gauge of what exactly we wanted to correct for next year. In the case of Von Me, Saigon, it was really his own parking space that he was most concerned about. He had his Friday business was exactly the same as it usually is. Um, we did spend uh, some extra time this year with Juan, the owner of Ibiza, and came up with a list of things that uh, he was happy with that were options for ways to uh, mitigate what he thought would be negative impacts, including um, making our, we have a um, uh, yeah. Vendor, what's it called? Valley yeah. parking, yeah, valley parking that night. So we're going to offer that to the Visa customers as well. Um, we've offered to pay for the parking uh, for their employees that day, <clears throat> and we'll announce the valet parking um, at the restaurant for a period of time before. And he was um, happy with those suggestions around parking. And then we also invited him to participate in the event if he wanted to. Um, have, you know, raise the visibility of this restaurant. Okay. Well, thank you for having those conversations and yeah. preserving the, what, as you know, is the delicate ecosystem of totally. uh, different interests down there. Totally. So, all right, well, thank you. Are there any questions from this back? Uh, is there a motion to <coughs> recommend approval of the closure of this lot? Is it moved? Okay. And the exact motion, just so we're clear for the minutes, is to recommend the approval of the closure of the lot from let's say early in the morning, February, uh, this is Friday, April 29th, um, until um, the morning of Saturday, April 30th, correct? So that is the motion. Any discussion on the motion? Okay, all in favor? Okay. Uh, opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Thank you, thank you very, very much. much. Thank you very much. This is a big time. ask. I appreciate it. Oh, thank, thank you. you. All right. Um, now, to summarize what, what we have in front of us, we have three traffic calming applications that have come to us today. We also have um, members of the Northampton High School PTO who want to discuss traffic calming around the high school. One of the traffic calming applications has to do with Nonatuck Street, and it might make sense to take that close by the high school discussion. Um, I would just like to ask, is there anyone here from um, Represented among those who filed the traffic calming application for North Main Street in Florence. Yeah, I, we didn't hear back from anyone who submitted that, so we'll sort of put that aside for now. Um, let me start, if I might, then with item 7C, which is a review and study of data gathered by the Department of Public Works and a possible vote on ranking of traffic calming application number 27, which is not a talk and Elm Street. Um, and this is a process that might be helpful for those who are interested in the high school because you'll get to see the whole traffic calming process. And to summarize it briefly, um, the way the traffic calming process works, this is a um, process that was developed a while ago by the Transportation and Parking Commission to ensure uh, fair, a, a fair process when concerns are brought forth from the public about speed and, um, and traffic flow. And so when these applications come forward with resident signatures, the Transportation Park Commission considers the situation and votes whether or not to ask the DPW to do a traffic study. That's what happened in the case of Nonantuck Street and Elm Street, and a traffic study 
was done measuring traffic volume and speed, and the results have come back to us. And so now it's time to consider the results and figure out um, how to proceed, if at all. So if I might prevail on a traffic engineer or um, Mr. Valletta, I'd like the DPW to kind of walk us through your findings um, after, after doing a study for the streets. Would that be okay? I don't know if we have any extra copies for the public. I don't know. Well, that's okay. I, I think it's been distributed in advance to some of the residents. <coughs> so, Ms. Chan, yeah, if you could summarize the findings. They did a study for Nonacup Street and Elm Street, which is about a mile and a half long stretch. It's a really large study area. Um, Nonacup Street, the speed poses the speed, sorry, the speed limit is 30 miles per hour. Elm Street posted speed limit is 35 miles per hour. There's various signage and pavement markings along these two streets. So for the study, we found that average daily traffic was between about 3,000 and 4,000 vehicles per day along these two segments. The average speed for Nonatuck Street ranged to uh, the 85th percentile, which is the percentage of vehicles that are traveling at or below the speed is um, 6 to 12. So the posted speed limit is 30 miles per hour on Montauk Street, and we found that people are traveling 6 to 12 miles above the speed limit. And for Elm Street, which is close to 35 miles per hour, people are traveling, the 85th percentile is traveling five to eight miles above the speed limit. For axle classification, the percentage of trucks was between 0 0.3 to 0.7%, which is a very small amount of trucks. The accident data shows that there are about 50, there are 50 crashes reported um, between 2010 to 2015. It's a really large number, but also two street. <coughs> So the major finding is there's speeding recording on both streets and a high number of crashes. Um, is there any comment from the commission? First of all, then we'll go to the public. Okay. Um, it's probably appropriate to start with the public, actually. Is there anyone who'd like to speak to this, the, the situation? Or just for purchase? A reiteration of what yeah. we've already shared? Well, um, this is Alexander Purchase. He brought the application forward. And um, you certainly don't have to speak, but if you have any comments and reactions to the, the data, you're certainly welcome to um, provide them. Don't uh, put you on the spot. It's okay. It's okay. I feel a little sick, so my apologies. Oh, I don't want to get anybody sick. Um, first off, I just wanted to thank the DPW because you all have been incredibly supportive of our efforts. And I commend you for working with us to try to find solutions based on the weather to laying down uh, the devices to measure volume and speed. That's been really helpful. So we've felt really supported in this process, which has been great, thank you. Um, I don't know what my neighbors would say about current situations on Nonatuck, but I would uh, just share experientially that um, speeding continues to happen on the street. Um, my sense of the speeding, it's a little surprising, although I wouldn't, I'm not surprised that the vast majority of cars that are speeding are going six to 12 miles per hour, eight to 12 miles per hour on Nonatuck. We still have a number of outliers and they're pretty consistent of, um, of cars that are speeding well above that, um, sometimes to the excess of 60 or 65 miles per hour. Um, when when we look at Nonatuck and Elm as, as uh, a contiguous corridor, obviously the high school um, is one area of concern because we do have lots of students that are walking down the street and there's no crosswalk <coughs> that's a, adjoining um, the two sidewalks um, around, uh, is it Pine Street? What's the, what's the street? Around Pine. Um, but as we travel up the street, we also have elder care facilities, we have the David Ruggles Center, we have the Starlight Center, there are a lot of, and Cooley Dick's back entrance, there are a lot of um, uh, community health services and public services that are being, being um, housed on Nonatuck. 
Um, so we still have tremendous concern about this. There are, as, as um, the older residents of Nanatuck, uh, some of the older residents have, have moved away. There's now a, a new influx of young families and many more kids on the street uh, who are on the street. And I hear pretty commonly a, a serious concern on the behalf of parents and families for the safety of their children. Um, not just uh, the sidewalks, I think people by and large feel pretty safe, but as you heard in the last uh, meeting when we presented the petition, um, <coughs> concerns about being able to actually get into your car on Nanatuck without um, concern for being hit is still pretty common among the residents. Um, and we're looking forward to understanding uh, more about how Nanatuck, based on this data, is then um, placed along the continuum of priorities for the commission. So that's, I think, one of the goals that we're hoping <laughs> to walk away with today is based on the research, the data, the findings, and all of these other considerations, um, high volumes of students, facilities along the, the street, um, bicyclists, which is not something that we've touched upon at all, um, where it is that Nanatuck would, and Elm would be placed um, in, in terms of priorities. I, I would say that I, I understand that I'm not an expert in, in transportation or planning, that 50 um, is a high number of crashes to have on the street, and, and um, I'm not sure that it actually captures the full extent of, of the public safety hazards of traveling down and being a resident on Nantuck, because although those are accidents that were reported to the police, there are just as many near misses. Um, so again, we're just really concerned as community members and citizens for the safety of ourselves, for the safety of our children. Um, one benefit of this process has been that we've actually started to become more of a community as we are talking to each other and in conversation about this process. Um, it's been a real benefit, I think, to all of us in getting to know each other a little bit more and realizing that, um, that the vast majority of people on the street, as indicated in the number of signatures we got, um, really feel like this is a serious concern and are grateful to the commission, to the DPW, for looking to figure out ways of addressing it. Yeah. All right, thank you, we appreciate that. And equally, we appreciate um, not only your community organizing, but your willingness to uh, go through the process and, and make a decision based on data that uh, this is the first step in gathering. So yeah. thank you for, yes. for helping that. Thanks. Um, actually, what you said is a, is a good segue to what we may do next. Although, I would first ask if there's any other comment from the members of the public. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I'm Maureen Scanlon. I live at 197 Nonatuck, and I am, like Alex, very grateful that we have this community that is going through this process together. Um, a couple of um, points that came up early on in learning about this process um, that was of great value to me was to know that we would be able to see this process through, including hearing what the recommendations might be <clears throat> and being able to, as people who know the neighborhood, I've been there 30 years, people who know the neighborhood might offer some insights that wouldn't be clear just by data. And I think Alex spoke to that quite well. Um, the other point is that I continue to hope people see is that at some point when the street was improved and widened, that sense of neighborhood was impacted in a way that we can't really go back to accept, to consider it in terms of having the street not just be one side of a very wide street and another side of a very wide street, but solutions or aims towards improvement that connect those, those various parts, including the adult daycare center and the medical center and the back entrance to Coley Dickinson and the two daycares and the Rubble Center. So to just take, keep in mind the nature of what really is a neighborhood in spite of how it might present to drivers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other comments? Natasha. Thank you. I'm Natasha Yakovlev. I also live on Nonatuck Street. And again, thank you all so much for the time and effort put into the study. Um, you spoke to the speed happening and the percentage of people who are going above the speed limit on Elm and Nonatuck. But I'm curious, and this isn't a question to be answered, but knowing that the high school's coming up, I think it's important to pay attention to South Main Street, Nonatuck, Elm, and Federal, mm -hmm. because that continues to be a near miss several times a day. And that, and it's not even about speeding at that, at that area, it's just about lack of visibility, young drivers, mm -hmm. bicyclists, people trying to cross the street, it's a total nightmare. So I hope whatever comes out of this that we can really pay attention to that also. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you very much. Any other public comment on this application? All right. Well, the segue I was, was talking about is um, to go into talking about what we are going to do next and what the process is now. And the DPW can always correct me if I'm getting this a little wrong, but um, at the stage right now that we have this data and it's been presented to the public and we're reviewing it, uh, we can, of course, discuss it more. But if we vote on something today, it would be, in fact, a vote on whether to ask the Department of Public Works to take the data and rank this project um, to answer the question, where does this fall in the ranking of traffic calming projects in the city? And the ranking is based on a number of criteria, um, with somewhat of a complicated formula. And then it will come up on what Ms. Chan referenced earlier, which is the total list of traffic com active traffic calming applications on the DPW website. So I have that process correct about, about this stage of the game? As far as you know. <laughs> It sounds right to me, it's what we've done before. What we're not doing would be coming up with engineering solutions at this stage, not in this meeting. Um, it would be a vote on whether to proceed and, and ranking in terms of priority, and then we have to match it with funding and so forth. So that's what, that is what I would like to do in terms of proceeding today, unless there's any other general comment on the study or the situation from commission members or members of the public. Right, do you want to do it separately or one at a time? Pardon? Do you want to do these all together or separately? All of the three oh, traffic oh. I think we should take this not a tug application. Then I'll move we have the CPW to, to the next step of okay. engineering to that. Okay. Any discussion on requesting the DPW to rank the project? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Sessions? Okay. So what we'll do now is we'll we'll follow up with the residents who brought this after it's been ranked and given a place in the queue, and then we can start talking about actual projects. And I would also note for the record, we have another traffic calming application that was brought by the Bay State Association in 2008, I think. Um, and that is ranked second to the top. And what I'd like to do without discussing something we haven't really posted on the agenda is, you know, we have $25,000 a year of capital money that the mayor um, has suggested for traffic calming, and I think this commission um, should be should ensure that that money is spent wisely according to the projects that we've decided to move forward on. So it's my hope actually if there's two two projects in this area that they can be synchronized in some way with community input mm -hmm. and hopefully uh, move we can move forward in an appropriate way. So Mr. Pallotti. Just wanted to make one additional comment. Uh, I know people have been uh, aware that the Hinkley Street reconstruction has been uh, on our uh, schedule for quite some time. We're uh, hoping that that's going to move forward this year. Um, in reviewing this traffic calming application, it became apparent to us that there might be an opportunity with the Hinkley Street reconstruction. So uh, we've taken a look and we're proposing to put in a raised crosswalk across Nonotuck Street at Hinkley Street. Um, okay. It's not an excellent solution. Typically raised crosswalks are most effective when they're uh, spaced at uh, intervals so that there's not an opportunity to gain speed between the uh, various implementations. Uh, it's one of the difficulties uh, when this does get ranked is how we might come up with an engineering solution for this very long stretch of road. Uh, but we didn't want to miss an opportunity with the reconstruction of Hinkley Street to at least provide some sort of mitigation uh, somewhat in the midpoint uh, there. So uh, drainage does not seem to be an issue, and uh, we intend to actually include that as part of the Hinkley Street project. Okay. That is Ms. Ms. Grant, did you have something? No. no? Okay. okay. Any <coughs> other comments in general? All right. Um, well, thank you. What, what I'd like to do is, is move to the high school, and then after that, go to Lincoln Avenue. Um, so I, I'd invite our esteemed representative from the Northampton Great. High school Thank you. PTO. Thank you. I'm Wendy I'm the president of the high school PTO. Thank you for having me. And um, I have a few members here as well. Um, I wanted to um, just revisit this topic of pedestrian safety at the high school, not only for our students and faculty, but also for our community members. It's a building that's used by all of our community throughout the day and evening. Um, some of the concerns that we have right now is, uh, as you all know and can imagine, there's a high um, incidence of a large number of people going into the high school from 7.15 to 
approximately 900 people, and again at 2.15 and 2.30. This, the observations that we see, of course, are people not obeying the speed limit. We have um, people that are, uh, cars that are not stopping at crosswalks. Um, one thing I want to call to your attention, we did, um, I did apply for a traffic, traffic calming request in 2011 when Laura Hansen was here. And then in turn, we had a traffic flow, and I wanted to get the title correct, traffic flow and pedestrian observation in 2012 and then I think as a result of that um, we had the rapid fire um, beacons installed soon not soon thereafter but I think that was in response to that um, but the, the the problems are continuing um, one of the problems that one of the PTO members that has uh, that had a near miss near the high school was the intersection of North Elm coming from Cooley Dickinson North Elm crossing over Elm Street, walking towards the high school. It's very, very dark there. There's puddles there. And that, that you will also see on the traffic flow and pedestrian observation report that was published in 2012. Um, in the, um, I think that's it for my concerns now, that I wanted to start this conversation and revisit this conversation, uh, knowing that it's a school, and I know there's some limitations because it's a high school versus a, um, elementary school. Um, and that's where we're at. Oh, thank you. That's, okay. that's a helpful Great. way to I, start. I don't know if my other. Yeah, is there are other members? Yeah. Can I thank you. Sure. So I'm a teacher at the high school, but I also am a homeowner. I live on North Elm Street between the high school and the hospital. Could you give us your name, please? Sue Sullivan. So I cross to, to walk my dog from North Elm towards the high school. And so you're running into people taking a left towards the high school, and they just come speeding towards that intersection. And you're on the, on the crosswalk, <coughs> and then people are driving up from Elm Street and racing towards the crosswalk. So they're not even stopping at the crosswalk, they, they stop beyond the crosswalk. And I had contacted Jody um, maybe about six months ago, because I was almost hit by the school bus at dusk walking and it was um i was coming from the high school going back up north down it didn't even see me so people are just really racing around from the high school and not even stopping at the crosswalk they're stopping beyond the crosswalk or they're looking left up north elm street to try and get out onto to elm street and they don't even notice you as a pedestrian and kids are not using the buttons and when they do people are not stopping and it's especially dangerous for like chorus concerts at night a lot of people were almost hit last time I went to the chorus concert. That happens twice a year, and that's like a thousand people. So it's really okay. dangerous. Well, so it's the lack of lighting, and it's the speed, and it's both crosswalks. And sorry to be, to be thick, but is there a more general visibility or specific visibility problem on the corner, or is it just kind of the speed that everyone's going in there? I think it's the speed and, and the concern it. about being able to just like get on down the street to get to wherever they're going. There's, there's no obstruction or anything that I can, that I can think of. Not that I'm aware of. I mean, there are cars parked right by the chiropractor in North Elm, but there is like a an area where you can't park. Right. Yeah, so, but it's definitely speed and not, you know, the, the flashing lights are not effective. And I'm afraid someone's going to get hurt. <coughs> yeah. Okay. So I'm definitely advocating for radius crosswalks. For radius crosswalks. Yeah. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Michael T. Pasquale. I guess I'm talking as a parent from the high school, uh, but I'm also on the subcommittee for the bike pedestrian, which I'm not sure if I can at all speak from no that No comment of interest. Go right on. Okay. Uh, so first the bike the, is joining us. Okay. Uh, the intersection where Child's Park is, and I think that's North Elm Street and Elm Street, Lane, it's, the, it's the same crosswalk where the flashing yeah. lights are. That is particular, and, and I live on Woodlawn, so I, I kind of know the intersection fairly well. Those flashing lights are just, well, the intersection is tricky because there's two lanes of traffic, and one track, one car, it's a classic where one car stops, there's a crosswalk, another car goes around to go right by it. And uh, that's, I think, particularly dangerous for high school kids who, uh, as much as I've told my kids, you know, that uh, when there's a car to stop, you can't be sure that the other car will also be stopping. And, and they don't usually stop. Uh, so that's, I think, dangerous. But also, the, the strobe lights that were put up, at least from the direction of downtown going out of town, 
going west on 9. Uh, there's a telephone pole right in front of one of those strobe lights, and it makes it uh, a little hard to see, uh, even. Okay. So that's, that's a concern. So I, I agree, and uh, I'm not trying to say that this is uh, any more dangerous than some other ones, but it's got some, some things um, that I think someone should look at sooner than later, because I, I think um, uh, there's the potential there is for an accident. And then, then, then the other thing I just wanted to talk about, because I've never been able to address you all before, is just kind of the, um, the idea to bring traffic calming, I think, more in balance with some of the other uh, ways we spend money in Northampton. You said $25,000 know, for traffic calming. It doesn't seem like a lot of money. And I don't know what the budget is for roads, but I'm sure if you compare them, it's a, it's a big difference. So I would just, uh, I'd like to put a, a, just talk a little bit about uh, Balancing, you know, we know, I'm an urban designer, registered planner too, and I teach uh, urban design at UMass. Uh, you know, we know that there are ways to design roads, more narrow, uh, make traffic, to do them in such a ways that the traffic goes slower. <coughs> we know that just speed limits in general, reducing speed limits uh, saves lives because slower cars in general are safer if, if they should hit somebody. So uh, there are ways, I guess, to approach this that are more proactive and less reactive. You know, the thought of people coming up here having to make cases for individual intersections strikes me as a little strange, frankly. That residents have to make this case, you know, for traffic economy. I get it, you know, it's a small city and all. But I think, um, uh, I just want to advocate, I guess, for a more balanced, proactive approach uh, to making, uh, uh, for pedestrian safety in Northampton, making our streets, sidewalks, and pedestrian um, ways kind of just, just safer and hopefully you know you know we'd be able to do it in a way that we'd have more money to spend than just what we do it for traffic I mean getting in line you know to and that list of traffic coming no thank you I mean that, that point is, is well taken insofar as our, our budget shows what our priorities are and we, we do spend half a million dollars every year on road resurfacing which is important but obviously um, being active on ensuring pedestrian safety is also important. And we had a great forum last week, um, right. at which you were, I yeah, saw right. you there, about pedestrian and bicycle planning, um, which is going to be important. For example, that's going to take over um, the study that kind of started in this commission about the 600 crosswalks in the city, which I'm, I'm happy to see. But I think the point is not at all at loss that this has to be a priority. And this commission has some responsibility to, to make it. This back pitch, thanks. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Any other? Mr. Nash? Hello, my name is Jim Nash, and I'm here with my career works hat on. Um, I, um, around the <coughs> high school, uh, uh, the, um, the issue with uh, the crosswalks there, I worked with them for years. I worked with Alex and John, and uh, Jamin is part of the public transportation. Uh, subcommittee we got the bus stops put in um, one, of, one of the interesting things about Elm Street at that point is that it's actually 35 miles an hour it's the fastest point between Cooley Dick and downtown we are actually encouraging cars to speed up and that um, I, I think one of the places to start is to simply bring the speed limit down um, if I, I, I challenge people drive try to drive 35 miles an hour through that narrow point where the cars are parked and you're like gritting your teeth to, ch ch to stay up at that speed. So I, w I, would, I would say that would be a place to start. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments <laughs> on, on the high school? Any comments on the commission? Counselor? Question. Um, is this possible, the, the flashing lights, is it possible to program them, I'm not sure if it's possible to program them so that during the high traffic times of between 7 and 30 or in 2 and 30 or whatever, kids are getting out, that they're just constantly flashing? It's just sort of to have drivers be alert, extra alert at that time? Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure. Um, there's no timing mechanism that's in them right now there other than the than the manually activation activated button. Can I just say one more thing? Um, Please, twice you this feel free to come on up. Okay, sure. <coughs> twice this year since, I believe it's August, the um, island that's in the middle of North Elm Street, right by the high school there, 
has been, uh, there's a sign there and that's been run over twice by cars. And the other day I was driving and someone, I didn't have my cell phone on me, but someone took a left out of the high school Elm Street going up north down towards the hospital. And for some crazy reason they didn't even drive on the right side of the road. That, that was just like an aside, but that British, sign has been British hit British. twice. Yeah. yeah, so there's some crazy driving going on up there. Um, I, I have two questions. One is, my understanding is, I don't know how long ago, but there's actually a road that goes by the school. And it pretty much just has dirt on it. Right? It was covered up. And I don't know the history of, of that road, uh, if it was removed because it was perceived the main thing. I, know, I think Bridge Street School has a road that goes right next to it as well. And that's Jimmy Hoffa. <laughs> Thanks for solving that mystery for us. But um, just a just a question for those with institutional knowledge. It was okay. removed. Council Giesel. Yes, that was the uh, initial. Uh, Alex Giesel, um, 164 Riverside Drive. That was an initiative early on as part of the um, Safe Streets program and traffic and early traffic calming and the work of Bay State Village Association, but also with the Northampton Police Department. There were an enormous number of accidents occurring uh, where that the street that existed up until, I'd say about 2000, uh, right around the time that the high school was renovated. <coughs> People uh, coming out onto Route uh, 9 from that little section, which is no longer there, looking left at traffic coming down would start out and then and then stop quickly <laughs> and the traffic behind them would rear end them they weren't serious accidents but a number of people uh, went to the hospital with back injuries and whatever there were a number of, of accidents and there was quite a bit of, um, of support from from part of the high school certainly uh, and from the committee that was doing the renovation to close that street, to eliminate it and bring all the traffic uh, out at a right angle to Route 9 so that there wasn't that, that angle. And, uh, and it happened. Good. Okay, that's helpful. I, I always wondered if... I'd say it's about 15 years ago. 15 years ago. It sounds like there was a pretty clear rationale to do that. So we won't unearth the, the road anytime soon. But. Uh, I was always wondering about that because I assume it just concentrated traffic um, where it is now. But, but okay, when did it? I just have one question. Does it, are there studies that show that <coughs> if the crosswalks are vividly painted with white paint, that there's less pedestrian accidents? And that's just a question. And in response to that, I know that the the, the is it the oil-based paint is five times costlier than the paint that we currently use on our crosswalks. There's some sort of paint that is much more expensive than what we currently use. And and can we consider getting them painted before June, uh, after after the winter, but before June, I, it, it's, although it's important, I know, for community members, but it seems like there's more traffic up until June. So it's just a comment. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. Is, well, to the extent it's also a question, do we yeah. have any, any data on that? I'm not exactly sure what you're asking in terms of oil-based versus. Uh, well, let me let me just tell you what the typical applications are. So, if the pavement is new or relatively new, we oftentimes use thermoplastic. That's what it is. I'm sorry. Okay. Yes. So you'll see that applied on roads that are repaved. Um, it tends to hold up fairly well for a certain number of years, but it also has its drawbacks. It does have a certain thickness to it, so plows tend to uh, uh, mm -hmm. take it off. Um, we don't do thermoplastic in the DPW ourselves, but we do do <coughs> refreshing the crosswalks on an annual basis. Typically that starts um, in late spring when the weather is warm enough and after the roads have been swept. Um, we <coughs> dedicate one employee to work third shift so that they can be in the middle of the road without uh, too much concern or less concern for the most part than, than during the day. It's literally one individual who repaints all the crosswalks in the city. Mm -hmm. um, so depending on the nature of the year, the timing of when the crosswalks get repainted shifts. 
Thank you. That's helpful. Well, I just wanted to pick up on the crosswalks. This is going to pet people, but you know, the idea of having one person do crosswalks is like one person shuffling the sidewalks or one person plowing the snow. So I'm, I'm not just singling you out. But it's this imbalance, you know, because there's a crosswalk, for example, near um, Newberry Comics, which my kids use a lot. That thing is painted, I think, in like October or something. I was watching it, you know, all summer, just getting worse and worse. So again, I tell my kids, no one can see you crossing that street because the crosswalk, you can barely see it. So, you know, when I hear one person is painting all the crosswalks in Northampton, it sounds like a fairy tale or something. So, um, again, I get it. This is a town with limited resources, but um, I just wanted to say that I, I've given a lot of thought to crosswalks, and I'm hoping that somehow we can rebalance things, you know? Uh, someone was just telling me that they did a tra traffic county application and they didn't pass. You know, so we can't afford to have someone get killed or, uh, you know, or something happen. So I'm just, uh, just using it as another example of the priorities. That's all. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I actually have a crosswalk related question, but I'll ask you, is there any other public comment in high school right now? Um, my question is, do we have restrictions in terms of this being an ambulance or an emergency room? You know, it's right near Cooley Dickinson. Because what I'm wondering is, you know, we're talking about a raised crosswalk on, on Nottetuck. Would a raised pro crosswalk make sense at there, at that location? Or is there some reason why we can't do it for ambulances or other routes? At which location? Right? Oh, sorry. You know, right crossing to Child's Park. I don't know of any, any okay. restrictions that would be in place. Okay. I recall North Street is, uh, I think, a secondary, if not a primary, um, emergency route, and we work with uh, police and fire to make sure that those raised crosswalks will be TPC. acceptable. TPC. Need more funding. Need more funding. More money. More money. More money. More money. It's all you got. So sorry for the, the interruption. <laughs> Who was that? Just, just saying that North Street is, I think, a primary or secondary um, emergency route, and uh, police and fire were okay with putting raised crosswalks mm -hmm. on there, which are spaced at uh, more typical five to seven hundred foot spacing. Interesting. Okay. The follow-up question I had is now that we're looking at a traffic calming application for Nottetuck, and you're looking at the Hinkley Street crossing, and there's an old application where um, I'm actually not sure which street it is, but it was brought forward by the Bay State Association. Um, Riverside Drive. Is it Riverside? Riverside. That's right, thank you. Um, does it make sense to look at this location in terms of what we could build potentially to improve traffic um, speeds in that location as part of a kind of a holistic plan? I don't know if that's too ambitious to put on the spring on you at this point, but it would seem to make sense to look at it in that way. Excuse me. Uh, one of the, um, again, if you're looking at that whole area, one of the places that's always been considered uh, both dangerous and, and needs a solution is the intersection of, of Riverside Drive and Elm and Milton Street. Uh, like three, which exits all of the high school traffic. And the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission in the late 90s, uh, did a, a very preliminary, very sketchy plan of a roundabout down there, take the land taking and the rest. But it was conceivable. It was conceived as a as a as doable and something that was worthwhile doing. Hmm. That's interesting. That's great information. Well, um, because I have a feeling we could continue to. Mr. Village, you have something? I, I just wanted to point out that at least my understanding that the the remedies for traffic calming applications for the most part are not big dollar projects. Mm -hmm. And doing something like reconfiguring the geometry of an intersection is a much more ambitious project, I think, than would typically be the result of a traffic calming application. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, I think the same thing holds with the geometry of Monotoc Street at the intersection of Federal and South Main. 
um, it's terrible. But to actually do something about that is, is a, a major undertaking of design and construction <coughs> that I don't think is really quite um, going to fit into a traffic calming uh, a, a traffic calming remedy mm -hmm. at this point. Has it ever been considered to make that a four-way stop? At uh, uh, at uh, South Main and, and Federal? I don't know. Um, that seems like it would slow traffic down everywhere on Elm and on a top end plus the... Well, it would slow traffic down at that point. You really have quite a, a straight distance in either direction mm -hmm. from there, but uh, you'd have to, we have to look and see whether or not the warrants are met. Um, there are a certain set of criteria that would have to be met in order to warrant uh, a four-way four stop. That's something that we could look at. <coughs> Any other discussion on this? Um, because we could talk about it all day, I would like today to be chalked up to taking input from the public and discussing it a little bit as we have done. And I'd like to put this again on an agenda for the future because I don't think we're going to create engineering solutions today. Um, so if that's okay with people, we'll the DPW can sort of take the lead on how we return to this in the future. But I imagine it will come back to the future. Okay? Any other general public comment? Oh, yes, please. I, I, could I, should I stand up? You're, please do, yes. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. Um, uh, my name is uh, Louise Martindale of 198 um, Nonatuck Street. And sorry to miss the beginning of the meeting, but I'm really happy that this is an agenda item. And I just wanted um, to address uh, the stop sign or possible stop sign, yield sign at Nonatuck and Maple. Like, would this be the appropriate well, We do have that or? separately on the, on the agenda. That's separately on the agenda. Um, Should I wait? <coughs> I, I hate to make you get up and get down. I mean, <laughs> Please, it, it's Jermaine. So. Okay, okay. <coughs> so, um, I reside at the intersection, the Maple Street and Nonatuck Street intersection, where there's been um, recent um, construction, a lot of accidents over the course of the last year. Um, and I know that there's been a study conducted for a potential um, yield sign, which I'm very grateful for. But I just wanted to ask the committee or the DPW um, for a couple of reasons to just consider um, the possibility of a stop sign. Um, I know that there are um, <coughs> certain um, qualifications that need to be met in order for a stop sign, and I saw those in the report. Um, but I wanted to bring it to the attention that at the Federal Street and the Elm Street intersection, which is a nearly identical scenario, there are stop signs. And so um, the criteria, as I understand it, is uh, daily vehicle count, um, that the alignment be skewed in a certain number of accidents. And it seemed to me that um, the criteria was nearly identical. So I just wanted to verbally make that request public um, because it is a safety issue. Um, there were three accidents in my yard um, this past summer. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. No, we appreciate it. If it's OK with you, we'll We'll sort of wait till we get to that agenda item to begin discussing great. it. But yeah, thank you for your, thank your you. comment now. Okay, thank great, thank you. Any other comment on, on the high school item? All right. If not, I'd like to close this this subject and, and move on. Again, with the understanding that we will return to it. So thank you to everyone who's, who's come from from this area of Northampton. Um, we do have two items. One is the yield sign um, at that location on Montauk and, and Maple. Another is a stop sign in the Henry Street, Montague neighborhood. We have Lincoln Avenue traffic on it. Um, and we'll get to those. We also have other visitors um, from the PBTA um, who are been waiting patiently. And if it's OK, I'd like to jump to that item because I don't imagine it would be terribly much. Um, so this is item 10 really 10 B and C. Um, expanding the bus stop in front of the Academy of Music by removing parking spots and moving the bus stop between Masonic Street and State Street to the intersection with Masonic Street. So I would invite our guests to sort of present the issue. 
Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity uh, to, to talk to you about this. My name is David Alvine. I'm a planner with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, where I'm assigned to work 100% of my time with the Pioneer Valley Transit Authority. And my boss at the Transit Authority, Josh Rickman, who's the manager of operations and planning, is here with us today as well, as well as <coughs> Jim Carroll, the manager, general manager of Valley Area Transit uh, Company, the Northampton Garage for PBTA. So uh, it's uh, just learned from Josh, it's a very interesting time at Pulaski Park. We've been watching with great interest the progress there. The new shelter has arrived and is due to be installed tomorrow. So that kind of occasioned us to um, be, be looking at how we could optimize the conditions there, further optimize them for um, pedestrians on the street and people using uh, the bus. And the, uh, the illustration you have uh, there that has kind of the before and, and proposal after shows uh, the location where the, the uh, new shelter is going to sit. It's going to be a little further back from uh, the street than the older ones were. And so that uh, led us uh, to, to, to some discussion internally about um, are, people gonna, are people using the bus in that shelter going to be able to see all the buses? Related to that, you probably know that we started uh, within the last year, the, the last year or year and a half, the X98 service. So we have another route running in Northampton. So we have, uh, at the peak times, at, uh, close to the top of the hour, as many as seven buses queuing up in front of the academy. And so we're concerned that people in the new shelter near it may not be able to see all the buses that are lining up. We also, because of this, um, currently the, the, uh, the queuing area stops prior to the crosswalk and there's a, a parking space there. Some buses have to wait around the corner and block uh, South Street some discussion about the concerns at that intersection earlier. So uh, we're hopeful uh, that uh, if buses were able to pull up all the way to a safe distance, six to 12 feet in front of that parking, uh, in front of the crosswalk where the parking area is now, we could improve things on the south side of the street there in front of the Academy of Music. Related to that, on the other side of the street, <coughs> you may be aware um, our current bus stop headed out of town, uh, up toward John M. Greenhall, is close to South Street. And it was relocated there uh, about four, five years ago. Uh, we'd been working with the previous parking director on optimizing that location, and there was some hope that by moving it to that location <coughs> uh, from where it had previously been, which was immediately adjacent to Masonic Street, that we could improve operations. And unfortunately, we've given it a given it a go, and it hasn't worked out very well. We continue to have problems where uh, people are illegally parking and there's uh, <coughs> conflict with the right turn lane. And so uh, we're having a condition where buses are needing to let people off in the street and they make their way to the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we think going back to this prior position immediately adjacent to Masonic Street where the buses have the open area of the intersection to pull in uh, to the curb will help us get passengers on the curb uh, more often than we're able to do so currently. So we have the two proposals um, to do that, uh, presented to visually there, and I've attempted to describe it in words for those of us like me who sometimes work better with words. And then I've also offered um, amendments to the, park, to the uh, ordinance. It, we, we would need to uh, amend the bus stop location language and then also the language for on-street metered uh, zones. Great. Great. Thank so you. we're happy to answer any questions or hear any, any feedback so people you might have. Let's put on two cents from PBTA as well. Thank you. So Josh Rickman, Operation Planning for PBTA. So I just want to really underscore uh, how important the Academy Music bus stop is to really PBTA operation. Um, we have over 700 people a day using that stop. Um, it is the hub of Northampton. So for us, in terms of uh, connecting for VACO and the rest of the PBTA, it, it is just a critical piece of our overall transportation infrastructure. Um, as 
also a new shelter going in, it's gonna be much larger, we're putting in real-time signage at that location. So um, it's really a big priority, and this, this is um, kind of our main visibility point. So just wanna make sure you understand how many people you are seeing per day, and any type of improvements might even encourage more people to ride the bus. Mm -hmm. Thank you, any, any questions? So the 175 feet, how many buses will that accommodate? Will you be able to get to seven and queue up in, into that space, or? Not quite. The typical bus is 40 feet. We also have a 25-footer, I think, that comes in there. FRTA has their Route 31, which is uh, also one of the buses that queues up there, and I think, I'm not sure, how, that's a 30-footer, I think. I think we use a 30-footer on the, uh, is it the 44? Yeah, 44. So. Um, we won't be able to get them all in there, but we think this will give us the space to get at least one more around the corner and again, improve the visi visibility for people using the shelter. Okay, so entirely solve the problem, but it'll help. Yes. Yes, we're conscious of your need to balance, uh, you know, revenue generating parking spaces. Um, and, oh, sorry. I, I mean, so, you saw the floor, Councilor. So, Councilor, then. Um, and then is, do you have any, I, I assume you're gonna have a similar problem moving the bus stop back over to Masonic that people are gonna illegally park there sometimes. Is there any sort of solution to mitigate that in some way or is it just playing in your business to deal with? It's something that happens more often. I don't know if you have any special phone numbers you call or things. We typically will call the Northampton police and let them know that somebody's illegally parked. Yeah. You'll still have the same problem where people will have to get out of something in the street and make it to the sidewalk if someone's illegally parked there, right? If, if that happens there, yeah. Uh, the advantage of this space is it does have the open area of Masonic Street where, worst case scenario, the bus has that, the area of Masonic Street where you can't park uh, to, to pull over, but then it's blocking Masonic Street. Mr. Biden. It's spot by the academy. It's also a weird spot. It's sort of an orphan spot. Yeah. And I think there's lower occupancy than in some of the spaces. That spot um, I would consider to be uh, a public safety spot because the vehicles that are parking in there are going to be small enough that when a person steps out <coughs> into that very popular crosswalk, that's located there. Mm -hmm. Oncoming traffic has much better ability to see that person. Um, if you go up to where um, Thorne's crosswalk is, and if you have a UPS truck parked there, you're gonna get the same sort of idea of what it's gonna look like when a person is walking out from in front of a bus. Um, that's why that spot, um, is so highly watched by parking enforcement and also the spot in front of uh, Thorns um, is, is watched closely because of, of those two types of crosswalks. Um, and, and it's a popular crosswalk. People are going across that all the time. And you know, you bring a bus up there, you know, six feet away from a crosswalk, um, I would be very concerned about um, people's safety stepping into that crosswalk. I think we're planning on being uh, at least 10 feet back from it. We're, we're conscious of this concern, you know, people step, stepping out uh, from the bus. So that's, uh, that's a very important concern. We'd set back as, as far as we could to help mitigate that. We also have the issue of uh, bike loading and unloading. That gives, that space gives a little more breathing space for us to do that there as well as for all the buses that will be queuing up behind it. But as that's another concern where we have people stepping into the street to load and unload bikes. How, how crucial, it sounds like the <coughs> expansion of the bus stop area in front of the academy is more important than what's happening at the other side of the street, which sounds like, well, that's a fair <coughs> characterization now, but it sounds like that was an experiment on the Mama and Guana side. Uh, <laughs> And it hasn't worked out perfectly as, as you wanted, but is it crucial to make that change? <coughs> the other is very important, but um, it's. I don't make you argue against yourself. Just no. see what I'm saying. No, I. Um, 
I don't, I don't know if I don't know if we've got a priority on them. Uh, we have the majority of the 700 customers a day are getting on and off at the academy side. So I think uh, we would serve more people. <coughs> the, the the Masonic Street side, uh, we have much many fewer people, and they're typically getting off because the next stop is John and Green, where most, if not all, of our students are turning back to come back to the. Um, Academy. So, I guess you know, in an effort to get everything um, as as uh, good as they can be for the Pulaski Park uh, area there, I, I guess I would make that a priority. Uh, I think he's consulting a map. <laughs> oh, the Pulaski side would be the priority. Yeah, I mean, it, it's tough to say. Yeah. It's, it's tough to say. Yeah. Sure. Uh, questions? Um. Sort of Ms. Forshaw's point, um, since we, we have redesigned Plastic Park, and so the, you know, the, the photo here shows the old Plastic Park, and while we still are just going to have that crosswalk there, part of the redesign is kind of opening that space, and we've removed trees to sort of make it easy, to make the park more permeable, that people sort of enter it in any different ways, you know, can enter it more easily from the sidewalk. And so it, is that sort of a more of a concern as well because you're going to have more people just getting into the park. You're going to have more pedestrians coming that way to get into the park mm -hmm. at, at that section. I'm, and I'm, I'm sorry, I, miss, I missed the question. Um, it was, I'm not sure it was a question that you could answer. <laughs> okay. Maybe actually more than maybe it's a question for Wayne or um, the, with the redesign, it's that, that that particular section is sort of meant to be more open and inviting to pedestrians. So is that a, a, an even further concern that um, if you have buses that are kind of near there, it'll be hard to see pedestrians crossing the street to access the parkway? By the crosswalk, perhaps? Yeah, I, mean, I expect the crosswalk traffic will go up. Right. But I think it goes back to David's point about having a 10-foot buffer so your buses aren't right up the parking spot. Okay, I see what and there's also a fire hydrant we saw on the maps. Oh, right. So you have, have to be hydrant. at least 10 feet removed from that. Uh, okay. Yeah. Is, is this a new fire hydrant that's going in, or one that's already it's current. No, it's, it's there. It's, I'm sorry, I can pass amongst you, but it's it's right next to the uh, right next to the crosswalk, which is a couple feet off of it. So I guess my question is, you, you're showing 20 feet for that um, spark parking spot, and a, a parking spot is usually 16 feet? It's so usually 18 to 20. 22. It could be 22 on the street. Uh, that yeah. one would be shorter because, because of the crosswalk. Exactly. So you don't need that. Yeah, they all, they, they all vary. Like the ones across on the other side of the street, they range from 17, 9 to 22 feet, yeah. so it, it varies, yeah. Did you actually measure this at 20 feet, or? I haven't been out there with a wheel yet. This, so this, this was all done with um, ortho photography. Uh -huh. Okay. Sorry, uh, that's fine. Uh, what's, the, what's, the, what's the verdict on the, the safety issue, is it? Um, What's the verdict on this? Is the safety issue that, that you have in Sports Hall only on the Masonic side? That's what I'm. That's what I originally thought you were saying. No, my safety, my my. Or only on the other side. Is on on the other side because when you're stepping out into okay. the traffic from Pulaski Park, okay. you're stepping out from behind the bus. I got it. That makes sense. Okay. So, and then you have that on, on the traffic. And any <coughs> solutions to meet halfway? And I mean, what is the what is the engineering um, standard for this? I mean, what like how much space do you need there to have a proper sight line for the pedestrian? I mean, that's really the question, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any thoughts on this? I don't have an answer. But. Well, um, since Ms. Forsley, you raised a concern, and it's an important one to address. I mean, do you have, is there a distance that would, would give you comfort in this case? Or is this um, well, your flagging I mean, and it's an issue? I, I think that it's a definite issue. And um, my understanding, you know, what we've done in the past when there was um, an issue about visibility at a crosswalk, the very first thing we did was to remove 
the ability for people to be able to park vehicles there. And what you're saying is you're, you're asking to replace a small vehicle with a very large vehicle mm -hmm. parked right in front of a crosswalk. I get it. I hear that. And we're not proposing to come right up as close as the current spot is, but I need to get out there. I think I need to provide you with some more information, the exact measurements on that spot. And I'm also aware that there's some industry guidance on typical setbacks to improve safety for the very kind of situation you're talking about. So if you'll let me provide that information to you, I'd be glad to do that. Okay. Great, thank you. Oh, Ms. Chan. What I know in the ordinance, you're supposed to be 10 feet away from a crosswalk parked for parking, but that's only if it's posted. That's only if it's posted, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, but if it's possible, maybe you could we could remove the parking line but keep the bus stop sign where it is currently. So you could the bus could go <coughs> than that, but not all the way up to the crosswalk. Sounds like that might be a, encapsulated in a, a counter proposal that comes after some further study of this. Is that, would that be okay? So I measured it out and it's 243 feet from the edge of Old, uh, New South Street to the end of the crosswalk where the parking is, down street parking. No, that's helpful, thank you. Um, are there any safety concerns about the other side of the street? Is there any desire to kind of split this issue in two and make a recommendation on the Masonic side? Or would the commission prefer? Because otherwise, it sounds like we're waiting on the Academy of Music side. So we can wait for both. Well, I have a couple questions about the Masonic Go side ahead. if you want to yeah. talk about that. Um, I. I guess one of, one of the advantages of having the current configuration is that the buses are intermittent and that allows for queuing in the right hand turn lane that's marked for State Street. And I don't believe that you're going to have enough queuing space available for the right hand turn lane as you put four parking spaces back up in that, in that area there. I mean, you know, my sense is that. You need to we need to lose at least one parking space on that side, and probably two, in order to actually uh, maintain uh, queuing for that right-hand turn lane on the State Street. So that would be my view. If you want to make that change, I think it's going to be sacrificing at least one, if not two, parking spaces to do that. We're actually just proposing sliding the parking I area. That. I understand that, but right now the, the buses are not there all the time. They don't park there. They mm -hmm. stop, they go. It's a very short time frame that they're there. And, and all the time that they're not there, that whole area is available for queuing on the right-hand turn lane. If somebody's parked there for two hours, and somebody parks there for two hours behind them, and somebody parks there for two hours behind them, that queue is not available as long as there's somebody parked in that last space as proposed. You see what okay. I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. So it's just something for the commission to consider in terms of parking. Is that a legal queue, though? Can you legally park your queue at a bus stop? I don't know if it is or not, but it's obviously happening. Yeah, that's the problem. Exactly. Right. I mean, and, and if the space is available there and there's a right turn lane, I think it's only natural for people to do that. I don't think they're going to be looking to see if they're queuing at a bus stop necessarily. Mr. Robert Fisher, I was going to make a comment, but that kind of changed my opinion of the matter, honestly. Um, but it does give me another idea, which I mean, this is crazy, but maybe you move it back to Viva Pasta, and then they're walking out in a crosswalk, um, and you've got less of that issue. I mean, the bus never stays there long that I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Sounds like procedurally, we sounds like we're ready to make a recommendation today. That yeah. doesn't uh, no, no, that's destroy your life, does it? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's a process. Life is precious, um, and we can and we could look at that and see how many yeah. spaces would be involved to get a forty-foot stop there. 
I'm going to do that. Thank you very much. I do uh, think you might have a similar issue as we were discussing before with the crosswalk visibility. Yeah. If you are pulling that stop to the east, you will have that 10 foot backing up so that could have looked more bus stops. I'm sorry, more, more parking spots. Um, but we will certainly bring all options to the table. I think the only other option that has not been discussed <coughs> at this point yeah. is potential consolidation. Um, this is a stop that's, that has a lot of the lights, but not many boards. So if we could, we'll, we'll continue to look at other options, but if we will keep the stop in front of the courthouse to keep John M. Green, we'll consider the option of elimination of the stop altogether. I don't believe that would be well received by our passengers, mm -hmm. but um, it is something we'll also put onto the table. Because it is, you know, in terms of us operating it out of there, so there's a liability issue for us as well. Mm -hmm. um, if we're in the right turn only lane, we're trying to get back left towards towards the college. I mean, we're with its weaving motions. There's issues with us, and mm -hmm. our claims officer doesn't like that either. So okay. we got to keep that in consideration. Well, we appreciate your ability, your willingness to, to think about this. And are there any other comments to kind of close this conversation for today on the commission? If not, then yeah, if we could circle back for a future meeting, maybe next month. Um, That'd be great. And we appreciate your time. Thank you for your thoughts. No, thank you for the input. It's very okay. helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, <coughs> well, since we were doing the, the traffic calming applications, um, we do have Lincoln Avenue, which is item 7D, application number 29. And um, like, like the Nonatuck Street one, I would ask our traffic engineer if she would mind kind of presenting the findings from this study. The same thing happened to residents. Actually, this is the second traffic calming application that's been done for Lincoln Avenue. Um, but because of the North Street construction and some other factors, it was actually warranted to do another one after a couple of years to get new data. And in fact, the data is, is a little bit. Um, and the concerns that were brought were similar. Um, speeding on the street. I would note that for Lincoln Avenue, there's kind, of, there's kind of three different issues. One is commercial trucks and vehicles that go down the street. And I'd like to make clear that that is an ongoing issue, no matter what the result of this study about speed, although this study does measure the number of trucks and it reveals that uh, trucks are a big problem on the street. But trucks are over here, we have general speeding, and then, of course, as we do with all streets, and actually as Mr. Nash um, raised when he was here, there is a question, is, is it ever possible to reduce the posted speed? Um, but these studies, of course, are totally within the frame of, are people going the posted speed? The question of whether the speed limit can change is different and normally requires the state, if you believe it, the state to take action on it. So that's what makes it complicated. But within the frame of the first one, just general speeding, the study was done. And I would turn it over to Ms. Chan and kind of summarize the findings of the case. Basically, Lincoln short segment of the block. There are about 20 kids. They range from newborn to about 11 years old. And I understand from the study that um, peak times are from 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock in the morning, and from 4 o'clock 
to five o'clock in the evenings. But I would like to add that I don't, <coughs> I don't walk my five-year-old to school at 8.30. I don't walk him on Lincoln Avenue because it's really, it's a lot of traffic and um, they travel quite fast. And I know it's posted as an average of 30 to 31. But in the mornings around that time, people are off, they're going to work, they want to get, they want to get there fast. So I don't even walk down the street, I walk on the dead end, which is the back of us. And I have to say that um, the rush hour really starts about 3.30, and it builds up around 4, <coughs> 4.30 to 5. But around 3.30, that's when all the kids come back from school. And they're all playing in the yard. And I know a few houses have actually put up fences in the front just to avoid the kids from, um, from darting out. But it still happens. Kids cross the street. Everyone knows each other. And so everyone's crossing. And sometimes it takes me, you know, I wait for like 10 cars to pass. Nobody stops for us waiting outside. So I, it's, a, it's definitely a high volume. And I just um, I get scared for the kids and my own son. So it's it's a real problem, and it's a problem when the kids are out playing, and in the summertime, it's, um, it's even worse because they're out there all day long. So um, I think lowering the speed limit, no one really look for the signs. No one really follows the speed limit up to a certain point. I think that speed hump, um, would actually deter people and slow people down. I mean, you know, it, it, it needs to be something physical for people to slow down. And I think that's the only effective way of slowing people. I don't think the signs would do anything. That's only, I mean, you're going from 30 to maybe 20, 25. That's, that's not going to do anything. It's such a high volume. Everyone cuts through our street, and especially because the light um, is at the end of Industrial Road. And on, is it Damon Road? The light that's on there? Now people cut through our street to get around, to get back on um, Damon Road. So it's increased in volume since that light has been put in. And I hear people say it all the time. They discovered a new route to get past that traffic that's on Damon Road. So um, I think, you know, with the increased traffic, we just, we really need a speed hump. Thank you. Thank you very much. Public comment? Address like that? Hello, I'm Camus Choi. I live at 22 Lincoln Avenue. And I'm on the other end from Tui's family. And I went to the um, bike and walk forum and I, saw the image of the two center lines and the bike lanes as are, um, as were recently put on um, Bridge Street. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering what would be the, um, what would be the mechanism for getting just paint placed on the street? Um, and we also did get a visit from the arborists who are going to be planting mm -hmm. trees which visually narrow mm -hmm. the street. Um, but again, the general question what's the tipping point toward getting some of these measures on our street? Um. It's a, yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, yeah. Bike lanes in general, <coughs> that's, I'm looking at Wayne Fine for bike lanes. <laughs> I realize you can't. It's still relatively low volume street, so usually we're doing bike lanes on arterials and not on smaller streets. Is on street parking? I'm looking. There is. So bike lanes mean no parking, but actually it could be worse, because there's not going to be that many bikes there, and, and Car is the best way to slow down speed. <coughs> what about getting out to the center line? Yeah, I mean, you know, so the whole point of this traffic calming piece is to have to maybe study it more and figure out does it, what, what solution. So I'm not sure what the right solution okay. is out there. But. All right, but that's, okay. those are my suggestions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Jim Nash, Ward 3 Association. Change the hat. Uh, so I too attended the uh, bike and ped forum the other night and they showed a slide which I found really compelling and we need to take to heart. Um, it, was, uh, it was the slide where it showed the death rates at different miles an hour. 
At 40 miles an hour, there's an 80% chance that if somebody is hit by a car, they die. At 30 miles an hour, which is what we're talking about on Lincoln, it's a 50% chance. If we bring it down to 20, it's 10%. I think we need to have that as a goal and that we can put trees and lines and whatever, but we need to figure out a way to work this out. This is a city street. We got kids, we have pedestrians. We want it safe that the, the, the fears that people have, they're real, you know? That they aren't making it up in their head. That when that car is going fast, that's dangerous. And um, um, so I'm saying we need to figure out a way to get it down to 20 miles an hour. Thanks. Thank you. Um, any other public comment? Well, if I, if I can just start, I mean, it's interesting because if 30 miles an hour speed limit, which people are going, data shows people are going 30 miles an hour. People are going to post the speed limit on Lincoln. And if that's not acceptable for Lincoln, it's also not acceptable for Orchard or Walnut or Elizabeth or My Street, Day Avenue and so on. And I don't say that in a dismissive way at all. I say it as, um, <coughs> I guess, an example of our evolving understanding of traffic in, a, in even a small city like ourselves. I mean, there's a piece of state legislation I know of that would reduce the default speed limit in the whole state. 30 to 20, because there are people who I think rightly point to information and research like Mr. Nash brought about the effect of different speeds um, in different accidents. So I think that that's a very valid point. I think our challenge as a city is we have this traffic calming application, which in a way is, has these limits imposed upon it, because the whole process has to do with seeing if people conform to the posted limit. When we go out, we do these studies, and in case of Nonatuck Street, in Elm Street, people are going like 10, 11 or more miles an hour over the speed limit. And then on, on Lincoln Avenue, they're not. Does that mean one has a problem and one doesn't? No, not necessarily. But what I think it does mean for this commission is that we can move forward with a traffic ranking for Nonatuck Street according to the process that we've laid out, which for better or worse, is to make the process fair. Someone earlier said, does this have to be always a citizen-driven process? And I think the answer is it's not. I mean, we do from time to time integrate this into our planning. Um, but when citizens bring forward concerns, we better have a method to take care of them and, and, and listen to them and make sure they're treated fairly. And that's what this is supposed to be. So in the case of Lincoln Avenue, um, I'm not sure um, there's, an, there's an easy answer according to the study. I would not be in favor personally of just closing the book on the study and saying we're not going to do anything. I would rather just sort of absorb this information and the public comment we've heard today and still have further conversations about speed limits and trucks and other things that we could do in the future. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the recipe to offer at this meeting. And it sounds like, in fact, there are many different ideas that have been brought forward by, by the neighborhood. But, that's kind of where I would like to leave because I, I wouldn't be willing to just close the book on it at this time. That's my thought. Ryan, what's the process again for lowering the speed limit? I know you said it's not just up to the individual towns, it's a statewide. There's a, mm -hmm. this, the State Department of Transportation that uh, effectively has to give permission. That engineering, <clears throat> that engineering study has to be done um, by the state to determine what the speed limit <coughs> is, if it's felt the current speed is inappropriate. Uh, that's an engineering study. I'm not sure how much they cost, but I do believe there's a, a fee associated with that. Um, and basically, you're stuck with the results. So whatever they determine is what they determine. If they determine that 30 miles an hour is the appropriate speed for Lincoln Avenue, that's what the engineering study will determine, and that's what, how it will be posted. If, if they determine it's 35, then it will go up. And that I actually will have another question. Could we, um, um, I'm sorry, um, could we finish the back and forth and then so thank you. Okay. The other thing, I'll, I'll just finish that out by saying that the, uh, <coughs> there are what are called prima facie speed limits established for um, different types of roadways. <coughs> Um, I think we're based on density, is that right? 
uh, density and, and uh, primarily on density. And those are streets, based on those criteria, they're uh, automatic speed limits that are set. And the only way to supersede those is to actually have an engineering study done to post a speed limit. So there are a number of streets within the city that actually have posted speed limits that are res the result of engineering studies that have been done over the years. But it would be prohibitively expensive to do these engineering studies for getting state <coughs> postings for every street throughout the city. So that's, that's sort of what I know. Okay. Uh, so it's the not, town, not the town recommends the town would have to ask the state commonwealth. And someone would have to pay. And someone would have to pay. Right. I got it. And whatever they say goes. Right. So you may be aware that uh, on uh, Route 66, there's uh, an anomalous speed limit given the road design mm -hmm. out there. And so this came up a number of years ago, and there was some uh, reluctance to actually have the speed study done because there was a concern that the result of the study would make it go up, which would make fewer people disobeying the speed limit, but would also make speeds go up. So it's a kind of a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. so Ms. Choi, would you like to jump in, or would you, do you want to have the um, permission? I, it's totally you're welcome. I, I'd like to jump in. Um, my question is, why is speed the only um, consideration. The, on 945 feet, there are um, 20 little children living, um, and 1,243 vehicles per day are going down the street at 30 miles an hour. I mean, is, are, the, are there no other considerations other than the poison speed just, limit and the fact that people are not speeding technically? Well, I think the answer to, on the state level would, would be the same in terms of the process to lower the speed. Might be incorrect. All right. I don't but know what about density? What about volume? Well, I guess my point is the speed limit, the speed limit sign, frankly, isn't that effective for getting people to try to slow or anyway. So the engineering right. step becomes more important. So the, the speed hump or whatever it is. So if you want to slow the speed, lower the speed, speed limit, you're more effective at dealing with the engineering than you are at dealing with both the state process. Because people will drive with what. People would drive whatever the road, the hidden cues the road tell them to drive. Mm -hmm. Such the cues we can focus on. Can someone give me some context in terms of the volume? Is 1,200 for that size street considered a high volume? I would say it's moderate given the location. I wouldn't say it's high. I mean, and like those, the other streets that are sort of parallel to it. I'm sure they're probably a little bit less because Lincoln is a little bit bit wider and it's easier to make that transition as you say for people that are cutting through. Just as a range, most of the arterials in town are about six thousand to twenty thousand and the neighboring streets are about a hundred to this this is sort of within that range, a hundred to a thousand. That was my question. Um, also um, if, if I remember right we, we had almost the same discussion about the union because that was the cut through from bridge and um, because it would have affected so many other streets as far as the, the speed, um, it seemed that the speed humps were the, the best option in that sense. I realized that there was private money that was used towards the purchase of those, but um, it seemed to me to be an effective um, response to it um, because I don't know if you've gotten any more feedback, but it, it seemed that union got some feedback. Good, yeah. Mixed. Mixed. But well, it's all. It's all relative. Yeah. Was there speed? Do you remember? Was there actual recorded speed in, in a way that's different from Lincoln? No, I think it was more the idea that <coughs> there was a high volume and it was the cut through. So I don't know if it, it's the sort of right. thing that we're talking about here is with the speed humps. Yeah, yeah. And again, I mean, this this body is purely advisory. Mm -hmm. um, I, traffic calming happens. I mean, I'm not sure there was a traffic calming study done for North Street. Maybe there was. We have speed bumps on North Street because that was just planned. I think there was. I don't know if you guys have traffic no, okay. calming. Well, any other discussion? 
how much you want to call it? I mean, I just think it's an ongoing conversation. I don't think the solution is, is obvious, whether it's painted lines or it's asking the state to go forward. We can certainly put on the agenda for the next meeting a request to ask the state to do a, a, a speed limit study um, pending funding. Um, but then, of course, we live with the results, <coughs> whatever they say. We certainly can talk about doing that. Either way, oh, wait. Was Carpet made to make a motion to ask DPW to rate this one as part of our traffic comment? <coughs> you could, although there's no speed. Over the speed. But yes, you should. Okay, so moved. Okay. Is there a second to rank this project? I second that. Any discussion on ranking the project? Can I, can I ask another question? Really, it relates to this, but it's not, doesn't answer that question. And that is, People are going through some, this street versus some of these others for things that not have a little more to do than just what's wide. It's where they have to turn when they get back to Route 9 on, on the, you know, if they're making that zigzag through, try, they're trying to avoid stoplights is what they're doing. And they choose Lincoln from what I gather as opposed to some of the others, because when you get down there to Route 9, it's easier to make some turns on that street than some of the other streets. I don't know whether that impact has anything to, to do with the why this one has so much, so much more um, traffic than some of the other streets have, but I don't know if there are considerations that could be looked at for that. I mean, I've known people that go down that street, that have taken me down that street specifically, not one of the other streets, because of, of, of the ease of, of, of getting down there and making turns. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I think Day Avenue was used in the same way, though. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, that's my concern, is, I mean, we, we have a process and streets come forward, and when there's no speeding on them, mm -hmm. um, we generally don't perceive traffic comment because of that. That doesn't mean that it can't be done in a different way, but there's a process. And I, a Union Street is a good example. I mean, Union Street is my ward. I'm not sure it's fair to have uh, people pay for speed bumps on, in part of the street when they may be needed in a different part of the street and people can't afford to put them in. And I realize that's somewhat of a different issue, but I do think there has to be a, a fair process when you pursue this. I'm not sure it's, if it's allowed or appropriate, but can a temporary speed hump be put in and then take in a poll from the neighborhood that if it worked or it didn't work, if let's say we didn't feel that the traffic calming study warranted public funds, could they raise their own funds and have one installed? I don't know if that's what they'd want to do, but if is that a possibility? Do we have temporary humps that we occasionally put on streets to see if pumps work or don't work, or is that something that just is done on a computer screen and data no, driven? Yeah, physical. That's, yeah. Physical, okay. You need to read it down for example. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is it a <coughs> disadvantage to putting it in for cranking? If, if, I mean, maybe this was your point, that if you want to keep this continued the conversation going, and it doesn't qualify in terms of um, speeding that it will then perhaps get a lower ranking but if we if we want to keep working on this perhaps we we don't want to move it to the DPW to rank it am I understanding well if we if we rank this project <coughs> what is the DPW let's talk about the ranking it's gonna it's gonna receive uh, I mean projects receive ranking based on their priority how important it is. So given the results of this study, is it evident that would the residents of the street want it to be ranked? Or is it going to be down at number like 30 and never ever happen? I mean, most likely going to be on the lower side of the ranking. Since there's no speeding and the volume is relatively low compared to other streets. Where the funding that we have would go towards 
we need a, we need as a city of more of a general discussion in terms of this uh, state funding for complete streets because I think one of the discussions is do we want you know when DPA was doing a street like Hinkley they're waiting for a bunch of Chapter 90 money to collect and do it on the street for traffic calming there's sort of two approaches you can do you know the big ticket items like non is going to be or the streets that <coughs> take two or four thousand five six thousand dollars of asphalt and so the question is in terms of ranking list We've always sort of thought it's an order ranking to start at the top and work down. But it may well be that we should be looking at traffic calming money and saying, well, that we should do this low hanging fruit where $3,000 makes a big difference. And we just haven't had this conversation yet. Any other discussion? No? Well, I'm sort of curious about what happened on Union Street and what the adjacent streets experienced as a result and if that information could be applied to this situation. Rather than put out speed homes, we know speed homes have some effect where they're located, but it's the <coughs> distance between them that has the biggest effect. I know they were put on Riverside Drive, which kind of only was 3,800 vehicle trips per day or something like that. It seems to be inappropriate to me just because of the number of vehicles. And I, you know, I think I'm sure Low volume streets, I think they make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. They also are more expensive than some other strategies. And um, Lane made a reference to the visual cues that are much better at, at um, <coughs> slowing speed than posting speed limits. The only posting speed limits have any meaning at all other than um, it's okay to go that fast. <coughs> and uh, so if you can design a street, whatever it might be, that compels you to slow down, then the posted speed limit sign that you sign is just sort of secondary information. Anything else? Um, I'm going to make a subsidiary motion. I move to postpone this to the next meeting. Um, and if there's a second, I'll explain why. Um, I don't believe we're making this decision based on uh, adequate information. And we could rank this and then Lincoln Avenue could literally never see traffic coming because it's like number 30. And we could rank it and then others, other streets that asked to receive traffic coming and didn't would see it unfair and they would have a case. And at the end of the day, no matter what happens, nothing is done. I'd rather continue the conversation, have engineering discussions about what we can do. You know, even if it's just line thing, I want to have that to be, uh, I want to be fully informed. Just, just I would also like to have um, more residents of Lincoln Avenue be able to um, know about and come okay. to our meeting. Um, so if we have, if we know we're on the agenda and we can sort of talk with our neighbors. Mm -hmm. And you know, we are willing to do a lot of things on our own, mm -hmm. but just to know what's allowed. Mm -hmm. And we've jokingly um, said we would just get a cement truck and put a speed hump ourselves, and then you said DBW would come and remove it, but there might be something that we could do, you know, yeah. whether it be fundraising just on our street, um, but I know this is not an issue that we want to be um, ranked at, yeah. at number 30 and then have it never come up again, okay. so. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other public comment? Okay, any discussion on postponement? I guess it's philosophically, I'm not sure that once things are rated, we should be saying, therefore, it's dead because it's number 30. I mean, it seems to me that the process we set up, unless we want to change it, is we rank these things, and then we figure out what to do with them. And so maybe it's our failing that we haven't been bringing those things up. But we should be looking at the list and not saying, well, because you're not on the list yet, it's going to get more attention than someone on the list. Because that was sort of the process we're, we're following. Well, I see your point, but I actually think the process is we affirmatively take a vote one way or another after reviewing the data. Otherwise, there's no point in reviewing the data. We're just <coughs> reviewing every traffic calming application on the process. And my concern is that might have a detrimental effect in the case of one can happen. We've had some projects that clearly just aren't a problem. And those are at least the ones that I voted against being ranked. Mm -hmm. The ones that just don't really make sense. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what makes to make sense to me to get more data. Okay. That's a valid perspective. And personally, I still want more information before I make a recommendation to rank or not rank. So Any other discussion to postpone them? Oh. Uh, yeah, please. Um, so we still have a line painting contract that's ongoing. Okay. So it's a possibility if the residents did want the street to be painted, that would be added to our list. 
there's a good example. But the thing about blind pain is that some might see it as more of a yeah. raceway at this thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is not for everyone watching at home. <laughs> um, any other discussion on the postponement? Any other discussion? I was just going to say there's, there's parking allowed on both sides of the street, so some double yellow center line might actually be of some benefit. Um, you know, if you do look at like Prospect Avenue where there's parking on both sides of the street and double yellow center line, depending on the configuration of parking, you actually have to slow down and sometimes actually stop in order for traffic to move through. Um, so it would be very easy for us to add that to our to the line painting contract. It's not a long-term solution. The line painting will only last a season. But, I mean, it'll still be there. It'll look great at the beginning, but uh, it will wear off over the course of the winter. Uh, certainly, okay. there's some initial. <laughs> Any if it's discussion? Just, discussion now. Gentlemen? <laughs> discussion to the question of postponement. We're not talking about the line painting. Postponement? Okay. All in favor of postponement? Say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Thank you very much. Thank you for your questions and happiness. All right. Um, blah, blah, blah. So no North Main Street folks here. Right. Um, we have two signs. Um, we'll shift to um, the Montview neighborhood. And we have the question of the addition of a stop, uh, a stop sign in Henry Street at the intersection of Henry Street and Venture School Road and Montville Avenue and review of the, of the DPW analysis that came. Um, which again, we lean so heavily on our, our very able traffic engineer that I would ask her to present um, to study the one page study she's done of this potential Is Mark talking about? Yes, thank you. There's an existing stop sign on the corner, the southern corner of Montreal Avenue. Mm -hmm. And there's a yield sign already in place on Venture Field Road. Oh, you just think that's a little on the side. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, you're right. <laughs> you could move up, too. Yeah, move up. So this kind of goes hand in hand with the ordinance that I submitted. The Venture Field Road yield sign, since there's a yield sign already in place. I'm not sure if you're but it's not in the order. I'm combining. No, that's perfect. But uh, for a stop sign, there, to go in place, there's three three different criteria that needs to be met. The first street needs to exceed 6,000 vehicles per day, that there are inadequate sight lines, and that the, there are more than three crashes within a 12-month period or five crashes in a two-year period. And if you guys are looking at the sheet, you can see that the criteria has not been met. And therefore, it's not warranted for a second. Well, first of all, thank you for putting this together and doing the analysis. Um, it's, it's helpful. Um, I'll ask the commission first if they have any questions or discussion. Okay, so. Um, when you measure the sight lines, how, I mean, so, I, I, this is a little awkward because I've, I've argued for the stop sign from the other side of the podium, but uh, anyway, my question is, when, the, the problem I have at these intersections is when I'm coming down Montview and I hit Henry, um, and I'm going to take a left onto that dead end to go to the dead end part of Henry, um, I, I stop and then I have to creep out on Henry if a car is coming, but simultaneously, my concern is that a car might be coming down Ventures Field. <coughs> I'm always sort of like looking down Henry and then checking Ventures, and then also kind of looking behind me to check to see if someone else is coming from Montview. And so that that gets, and also you can also have traffic coming down the short end Henry too. So there's sort of many sidelines that I feel like I personally deal with that intersection. So I'm just wondering how how sideline gets measured. So there's an equation to measure safe stopping distance. That's when you see the distance when you see an object and the length that it takes to stop safely without collision. Mm -hmm. And so I've measured here that at 30 miles per hour, 196 
Because you understand what the, the situation I was presenting, right? Where I've got sort of different things that I'm trying to keep track of at the same time. I think I understand what you're talking about. Okay. You're worried about Ventress Field Road and the other side of Henry Street when you're trying to make a left, correct? Onto the dead end side? Right. Right, right. Yeah, so it's not just the sight line coming down Henry, it's also the sight line that's coming sort of diagonal down Ventures, mm -hmm. and then it's someone's then coming behind me on Mossview. Mm -hmm. I personally don't think there's a warrant to be putting in a stop sign on Henry Street, given what we found with the data. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now we do have residents who actually live here who may have their own perspective to share. Um, so if I may, would either of you like to provide? I know Jim does. Yeah. Okay. You're going to have to share. <coughs> Keep them in order. Okay, so photo number one. This is the approach to the intersection from Montview Avenue. At roughly 100 feet, the stop sign is not visible. Also note the wide expanse of pavement. This intersection is 65 feet long from left to right. Okay, and that's part of the problem. Um, photo number two. I should have numbered them, but... Um, this is about a dozen feet from the intersection. The stop sign is now visible. And this is what uh, Councillor Shiara is talking about. Is she's in this position looking at this sign. And as you can see, there's a hedge right there. And um, now go to photo number three. This is my car parked at the stop sign on Montfield. Um, this is the one from across the street. Um, uh, from this vantage, one cannot see around the, cor the corner. Note where the stop sign is. It is several feet from the actual corner of the intersection. Also notice that there is no sidewalk near the front gate of Darren and Kate's home. That's the house there. Bringing the traffic lane right up against the hedge. So we're losing that buffer of having a stop sign, you know, that you have a sidewalk and then a stop sign, cueing drivers to stay farther away. Um, let's see, number four. Uh, note that the pattern, note the pattern of the ice on the pavement. You can deduct two things here. You can see how the lack of a sidewalk and a curb brings the traffic very close to Darren and Kate's hedge. Also, you can see how the eastbound traffic on Henry leave their lane and cut the corner. Something you, you, you cannot see is my car parked behind the hedge, much the way neighbors appear at night when we venture into this intersection. Photo number five. Here is my car pointing eastbound on Henry Street. I did this late at night, by the way. <laughs> um, uh, note that the right-hand side of the car is just off the ice buildup. Um, the ice buildup demonstrates that most drivers traverse the intersection from Henry to Ventures Field, that's up the ramp, up the dike, and do not traverse it in a way the traffic study indicates, which has drivers 
coming up on Henry Street and stelling, staying well to the right. Drivers routinely veer into the oncoming lane, and thus the situation that Councillor Shiera is talking about, as you're sitting at, sitting at the stop sign, you're inching your way out because these drivers are veering over into your lane. Um, the last photo. Um, let's see, hold it, which one? Are we up to six? <laughs> okay, here's my, here's my car from Ventures Field Road. Um, it is far from being in the proper lane. This again shows how that most people travel through the intersection. Um, and the last one, number seven. This is the view from the stop sign at Montview of my car. At the moment I took this photo, it's stationary, but we routinely deal with vehicles traveling anywhere from 25 to 40 miles an hour while nosing our way out into Henry. Uh, while the city's traffic study, bound by state measures, found that this intersection does not qualify for a stop sign, clearly there is a problem with the traffic flow and something needs to be done. While there are no reports of accidents or injuries here, I can attest that accidents occur. Uh, most accidents are of the too embarrassing to report variety. They involve vehicles veering into the snowbank or down into the grass uh, on between Henry and Ventures Field. One even plowed into the enormous rock at the end of Ben and Una's driveway. Um, as City Councilor Shiara, the Vice President of the Committee, <laughs> has already shared with you the difficulty of stopping on Montview and turning on to Henry. Many neighbors have expressed their concerns, and these concerns go back over a decade and are reflected in the work of the city's first successful traffic calming application. I would like to see stop signs for all approaches at this intersection. The intersection is highly irregular, over 65 feet in width, yet Henry Street is just 18 feet wide. The intersection is just plain confusing. Prompting drivers to stop and consider their path just makes sense. Stop signs are common practice elsewhere in the country. Stop signs have been a low-tech, cost-effective solution at the intersection of Prospect, Woodlawn, and Jackson, as well as Florence Road and Burt's Pits. And if you say the state won't allow stop signs, then, then let's get our representatives on the phone and begin to change this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm uh, Maddie Weaver Blanchett, um, and I, um, my house is uh, 41 Valley Street, but actually the majority of the property is oriented on Montview, so most of these photos sort of run alongside of the edge of my property. So I just wanted to say a couple of things. One is I just really appreciated the thing that Mr. Fiden said about People picking up, um, people picking up cues, sort of unwritten cues for how to operate their vehicle um, from the environment. And I would say that is, you know, that really rang a bell with me. But then I want to take it even one more level, and I want to kind of make a comment about um, almost the cultural cues in our neighborhood for driving. And I'm actually a Northampton uh, native. I moved away. I came back and. I told an old friend who I grew up with in Northampton that I had moved to Valley Street and he's like, oh, do you need a rural post office drop there or something? What I'm saying about the neighborhood is that it's, it has a, it's like the Wild West. I mean, it has a culture of, of sort of a farm road feeling. It has, it's, it's a great place if you're, you know, driving while intoxicated and you don't want to go down <laughs> Pleasant Street because there might be a DUI stop. We get a lot of activity like that in our neighborhood. I mean, honest, two weeks ago, a couple fleeing Hadley police and Northampton police after shoplifting, in, you know, in, in, uh, in uh, Walmart in Hadley, they, they came flying over Ventures Field Road. They're going to take a big, I mean, the captain is nodding her head, and he pulled into my driveway and hit the deck, you know. So this is like, <laughs> If only I'd hit my crummy car, you know. But um, anyway, but this is what I want to say about this neighborhood that I don't think shows up in, you know, a really kind of um, completely objective traffic study, which is that there's wild, erratic 
driving in our neighborhood. And, you know, again, uh, on, uh, especially I would say on, uh, you know, labor, uh, when we have the fair, you know, everybody cut. It's a big cut through. And I mean, uh, you know, it's just pickup trucks and it's speeding, speeding on Henry Street. And then, you know, you fly up Venturehurst Field Road, you know, you come down, it's beautiful and open. I mean, whatever. It's anecdotal, but you know, if you live there and you walk, it's unbelievable the risk-taking driving behavior that you see. And, and um, I really just don't feel like it's captured in a study like this. The other thing that I just wanted to say, um, which I think maybe I could reflect back on what Council Shara said, I think what you're asking about sight lines is could it be weighed in the compounded nature of having to check five sight lines. Okay, so even if maybe there's not like a giant obstruction for one, the fact that you're getting up there and you're having a driver would have to do like check one, check two, check three, check four, check five because of this bizarre thing of there being, you know, a significant farm road there with a lot of vehicle traffic and Ventures Field Road and the Henry Street dead end, you know, anyway. So I wanted to say that. And then I wanted to say also um, other cues, you know, that people are getting from our neighborhood is that um, <clears throat> on Montview, we don't have a tree strip. We ha our, our tree strip is so degraded that it's tiny. In fact, now the sidewalk is so degraded, it doesn't exist. So, you know, it's getting, it's like cars, they're winning. You know, they're winning in our neighborhood. So, um, <coughs> you know, I think that that's a significant factor. And then I want to say um, our neighborhood um, is the recipient of major zoning changes. So we, we know it's only be going to become more dense. So we, you know, we know of major development plans that are in the works there, and so um, I just, you know, I, I don't, th I don't know what exactly the pleading is, but I'm saying like, you know, um, can we consider our cultural knowledge and our political knowledge of this community and of this neighborhood in considering the stop sign, which I think is highly warranted. In fact, people have talked about a roundabout there. I mean, what can we do to really make it safe? Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to just make a quick, quick point on, on time. And then, um, this is congratulations on the longest meeting which, since I've been <laughs> part of it. Um, and I just, I would remark, because there are, I, I actually think you're right that there are special considerations for this neighborhood. And I wouldn't feel comfortable making a decision today anyway on this issue. So I just point that out. I know we also have um, a resident who is in a different sign um, um, of interest to her. And she's already spoken about it. But I, I also want to be realistic. We're probably not going to address that fully today as well. The, the non-tech sign won't? Well, I'm probably not going to make unless unless you are totally fine with the recommendation of the yield sign, which I don't think you are. I'm but, not. I'd like to yeah. formally request that yeah. the findings be reconsidered for a stop sign. But I can maybe put that in an email with I just think and thank well thank you. I, I think it's just I was making the point I'm not sure we're gonna we're gonna solve the, these items or really the, we have like other items on the agenda too that we're not gonna get to. So just like to make that point. So anyway. Wayne. I think that's one more question for DPW you know, because they did the analysis. But you know I'm sort of a big believer in don't let the good be the enemy of the perfect. And I, so I, I totally agree that it needs to be more in Montview. I guess the question is, given what you heard, is this still a good first step going forward? Just what the Doing the stop sign? No. Oh, okay. It's not warranted. Okay, I thought you guys were advocating that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry? Okay, never mind. I missed your stuff. I thought you were advocating that. The stop sign is not warranted, but I don't think that means the end of the conversation. Okay. But I don't think, but I don't think that a stop sign is the solution because we, really want to maintain that basis for putting in stop signs because they're established that way for a reason. Okay. Is there anyone else who hasn't spoken would like to speak? Mr. Mash. I'd like to change my recommendation to redesigning the intersection. Thank you. <laughs> to a, to a I mean, you know, we can't put in a stop sign. Let's redesign it. Let's realign the streets. Let's put in, you know, let's do all of that. 
That's what the choice is here. Okay. Um, and I'm willing to wait on this decision. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I don't think it'd be appropriate to make a decision. Today. Well, you can put off discussion. I, that I'm fine with that. Yeah, I do think there are unique neighbor concerns here. Um, well, unless there's any other discussion, I hate. I, I feel. I feel bad. We've gotten to the end of this meeting. Um, I'd ask the residents if, if there's anything else they'd like to say or questions they'd like to ask, because I hate for you to feel like you sat through what is the longest meeting you've ever had. <laughs> But, um, uh, yes. Could you just clarify the outcome of this agenda item? I'm sorry, I'm just None. not understanding. <laughs> None. Uh, okay. The outcome was we heard from residents. Okay. And I, I thought I wouldn't feel comfortable making any decision about not doing something or doing something. Okay. I, I consider it to be open, like I would the Not a Tuck Street sign. That's so is that, so that Not a Tuck Street sign, would that be an agenda item yes. at the next the meeting? Yes. Or, okay. yes. Okay. So we're thinking next month's meeting? We can certainly do that, yes. Yeah. Okay. At the beginning of the meeting. And what is the date of that meeting? It will be the third Tuesday. So um, I would just ask without objection if all the items we didn't get to can be tackled at future meetings with objection to doing that. Um, any new business today? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Is there a second? All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.